Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of integrity. Sort of a, an inquiry into uh, business ethics and ethics in general. It's going to have an, a business slant to it. I can adjust that depending on the audience. But uh, since most of my focus is on business, it's going to have that kind of feel for it in this sample. Um, I would like to start out by saying really enjoy giving this presentation and the most uh, significant reason for that is I feel that integrity is often not covered very well in the typical business training or business uh, presentation setting. Um, the reason for that is I, I find that a lot of the presentations are a bit trite and a bit predictable. They talk about, uh, you know, they'll tell a story about someone at work trying to do the right thing, but they're confronted by a mean and evil boss who tries to stop them, and then they tell on the boss, and everybody else gets the, uh, fires the boss, and uh, all of a sudden they get promoted and rewarded for doing the right thing. And these are always black and white, very clear-cut issues. And while I think that that does happen, I don't deny that, I think that doesn't really help the audience very much in terms of understanding. It helps the speaker because everybody pats them on the back for advocating doing the right thing, and it helps the company because 18 months later, when their CFO gets caught lying to investors, they can always say, oh, we have no idea how this happened. We have a vigorous integrity training program. But it doesn't do much good for the actual business people in the audience because the, it gives the younger persons a distor an overly simplistic view of, um, of, ethic, of, of business ethics and the, the dilemmas they'll confront. And it gives some of the seasoned veterans, uh, causes them to roll their eyes because they know that that's not what they're really going to be facing. So uh, I deliberately like to weigh into the ambiguous areas and I think that there's a lot to be learned from that. It does mean you will get fewer simple answers but I think it'll give you a lot more applicable answers. And frankly, just knowing the frameworks can help you develop a certain self-awareness. So if you see yourself sort of falling into a rationalization, you can remember that, oh, I, I know this pattern, we talked about this, I see what's happening here. So with that in mind, uh, let's get started. Although I, I will say, if you, if you would like to pay me a ridiculous amount of money, I would be happy to write a trite and predictable presentation for you. But if it were up to me, this is the one I would give. Let's start out with talking about fragility, and this is where I am at my most provocative. I, I start out by saying, you're probably not as good a person as you think you are. And that goes for all of us. And the reason for that is studies have found that we tend to exaggerate our, our self-awareness, our interpretation of our own honesty and integrity. And uh, for example, one study pointed out they would, they would ask people, they didn't ask if you lied, they would introduce you to a stranger and then give you 10 minutes to talk and what they'd say is on a, they would then ask uh, did you what what statements did you are there any statements you made that weren't entirely true and when they make it sound so gentle people are more willing to admit it and it turns out that within the first 10 minutes the average person tells about three lies and I always like to emphasize, you know, when you tell an audience that people aren't as honest as they think they are, the audience is always tempted, every individual in the audience is tempted to think, well, yes, they're not. And it's important to remember, it's not just everybody else. It might and is most likely you as well. So we tend to overstate our levels of integrity. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the games I like to play when I present is uh, if I have the luxury of giving multiple presentations, in one of them early in the day, I'll tell a story about Microsoft where Bill Gates was asked by IBM if he had a, an operating system to set, put on their PC. And he said he did, when in fact he didn't. And he then, after he got the contract, he then went out to somebody else who actually had one and bought it from them. And he paid like $10,000 and became a billionaire off of it. And I always ask everybody, uh, who here would like to make a deal like that? And everybody raises their hand. Then later on in the day when I'm giving the integrity presentation, I start out by saying, how many of you people believe it's right to lie to your customers? Nobody raises their hand. And then I have to point out that that's actually what Bill Gates did. He told them he had something he didn't have. And so, you know, it, it illustrates to the audience how easily we are, uh, uh, how, how, how fragile our integrity is, how easily manipulated it is. Um, another example is, uh, I, I like to use the movie The English Patient. And at the end of this movie, the man and the woman end up not together. Sorry for the spoiler. Um, and everybody thinks it's terrible, but it's always important to point out that the woman was actually cheating on her husband with this lover. And I've always found that kind of ironic. I think if you asked people going into this movie, how many of you support marital infidelity, nobody would raise their hand or agree to it. But coming out, if you ask them, 
how do you feel about the fact that they could, she couldn't be with her lover, everybody would say, oh, it's so disappointing, which is in fact endorsing marital infidelity. So those are a couple of examples that show you how fragile those things are. They've also done some experiments. There's a famous experiment called the Milgram's experiment, which was done to figure out how so many uh, sort of not particularly hostile people in the Nazi bureaucracy were able to perform such acts that, that led to the, the, the murder of so many people. And what they found is people respond to authority. They had, uh, they had people giving an electric shock to people who answered questions incorrectly and there was a wall so they couldn't see. The truth is the people weren't being shocked, they were just acting, but they wanted to see how much people would shock them and, and, and they continued to escalate the shocks. And um, it turns out that without any monetary incentive, just because the person told them, the instructor told them you have to keep going whenever they protested, there was no coercion, they found out that most people would actually shock them until they had passed out and many people would actually shock them beyond the point at which they thought they had passed out. So that was a really illustrative of how very average people can, can end up doing some very bad things. Uh, another example called the Stanford Prison Experiment. Uh, this is a famous example where they took graduate students and made some of them prisoners and some of them wardens and they simulated a prison environment and they were so cruel to each other within just the first few days they had to call their cut their two-week experiment short and these were actually sort of idealistic young graduate students so if they could do it it was amazing i'll get to some of the reasons for these when we get to rationalization um, also the harvard business review conducted a uh, wrote an article about uh, you know how, how maybe the standards of business are different than the standards of elsewhere and a lot of people wrote in and said that's ridiculous uh, you shouldn't assert something like that business is integrity should be no different than anywhere else integrity should be paramount and the author went back and looked at some of the people who were writing those complaints and each of and, and many of them had their own ethical lapses that they weren't acknowledging, such as many of them uh, owed money to their suppliers or they had deceptive advertising, uh, they were being sued for non-payment, things like that. So oftentimes, this gets back to my point earlier, we always think it's someone else who has the ethical problem. We, all, we oftentimes deny that it's us. And then the last one, this is kind of a provocative uh, point made in uh, either fr Freakonomics or Super Freakonomics, the Stephen Levitt, uh, The Economist's book. He said, you know, if you look at all these incentives and how easily we are manipulated into doing malicious things, maybe there's no such thing as a good person or a bad person. We're all just people and we respond to our, the environment that we're placed in. I don't think that's literally accurate. I think that's kind of an extreme view, but it is a provocative one to consider. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about business and maybe what constitutes uh, integrity. And I like to use the example here of, uh, I do a sort of a, if, if I were a really honest salesman, let's say I were selling you a car and you came to me and said, this is a really great looking model. I think I should buy this. And I said, yes, it is a great looking model. Of course, it's re remarkably unreliable. It's not very safe and it gets terrible gas mileage. Now, clearly I am an honest salesman in that, in that instance. But I think we can all agree as business people, that would be a pretty high expectation to volunteer negative information, even if it's accurate, just to give someone a well-rounded perspective. So let's get a little bit into the gray areas there. Um, the first one, you know, obviously a lie uh, is, uh, let's just say knowingly saying something that's untrue. But I think that's the easy uh, and the most obvious example of something that uh, is qu questionably uh, questions the integrity. I like to talk a little bit more about some of the more ambiguous areas, such as giving selective facts. They are facts that are true, like, yes, this is a good looking car. You should definitely buy it. Those are, that's a, the, the truth is that it's good looking. You are selectively avoiding revealing other facts though. Um, I also, uh, a variation of this, wanna point out a variation of this that I call, uh, sometimes a salesperson doesn't answer the question you asked they qu answer the question you, they wanted you to ask. So for example, does this car get good gas mileage? I'm glad you asked about the performance of this car. This is one of the fastest cars we have. Nobody complains about the performance. And that would be an example of sort of the, the, the dodge. Also, you have the example of what my uh, uh, business professor used to refer to as literally accurate, but intended to mislead. And this is where you sort of get by on a technicality. A good example of this was the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky case, where he claimed that he was never alone with Monica Lewinsky. And then when they found out he was alone with Monica Lewinsky, he said, oh, in the room, I thought you meant the building. 
And so that would be literally accurate according to his interpretation, but clearly intended to mislead. Um, another example of that is when you rule by exception. A lot of salesmen, you might ask, hey, is this, uh, is this a good business investment? And they say, the last guy who followed my business investment advice became a millionaire. But that's, that might be only one of the 999 people they advised and the other 999 went broke. So it's a true statement, but it's the exception and it's intended to mislead by giving you the impression that, that it represents the average or the expected. Another example of that is overconfidence. This is where you will, um, if, if there is ambiguity around whether or not something is true, you will deliberately not look, you will deliberately interpret it in the most flattering way for you personally. So for example, during the financial crisis, there were a lot of critics who said a lot of financial advisors were selling their clients products that they knew were bad. But sometimes it wasn't that they knew they were bad, it was just highly likely that they were bad. And they deliberately interpreted it as being, well, you know, because it might be good, we are going to adopt that uh, philosophy and say that they're good. And that is sort of a creating overconfidence uh, or, or misinterpreting ambiguity when it helps your case. There's also something there that I call selective skepticism. If somebody tells you something you're doing is possibly good, you take it at face value. If someone tells you something is possibly bad, you might say, hey, well, well now wait a second, let's not jump to any rash conclusions, let's see the proof, let's talk about the evidence, and, and so you're, that selective skepticism is a variation of that. You're trying to look for reasons to interpret the most flattering, in, in the most flattering way. Um, and the last one I want to talk about in terms of honesty is uh, sometimes you can bury the facts. This is the classic, you, you tell the people the truth, but you bury it in the fine print under the expectation that most of them won't read it. And that's, uh, that's another sort of questionable, but not obviously dishonest practice. Um, also, there's a, these sort of deal with honesty. Let's talk about some other business specific issues that aren't necessarily lies versus truth, but are uh, questionable in terms of their integrity. Um, I always say one, person, one man's persuasion is another man's manipulation. Uh, if you look at some of the theatrics, for example, if someone gives you an offer that would be acceptable, but you act shocked and, oh, that's terribly low, I, I don't even know if I can do that. You know, that's, that's clearly trying to persuade them to pay more, but there's a question about whether or not that, but if it's not, uh, if it's not necessarily accurate, uh, then it could be considered manipulation. Um, also, I, I like to point out there, uh, there's a sales pitch that I've heard at some of the conventions. There are people who sell insoles for your shoes and they say, um, they'll say to you, what's, the, their approach to you in the aisle is, what size shoe do you wear? Obviously, the reason for that is if they asked you, do you want to talk to me about my insoles, you might say no. But what size shoe do you wear is not a, doesn't have an option of denial. So that's an attempt to try and manipulate you into speaking to them. And the uh, the last point I want to give on that is, um, well, let me skip over it for the sake of time. The, uh, another issue that you might face in terms of business integrity is what I call the intention to change. So you enter a deal knowing that you will probably be um, trying to back out of it. So for example, um, I've had people hire, uh, you might hire someone to do a job at a given price knowing that when, the, when they come back and ask to get paid, you're going to look for reasons not to pay them full price and look, I'll give you half or nothing, take it or leave it, you can sue me if you don't like it. That's go entering into something with the intention to change. Perfectly, uh, arguably legal, um, but not necessarily uh, moral. Um, also, this is the change order. So oftentimes if you're bidding on a contract, you're going to bid deliberately low, knowing that, there, that you would lose money at that price, but knowing that as they uh, as they require changes and more things are found out about the project, if it's a complicated project, you know that you're just going to stick it to them once they get the, uh, you know you expect to raise price once they start making changes because you're going to charge them a premium for those change orders. So that's an intention to change. Also, I want to talk about the failure to stand behind your product. Um, there was, a, my favorite example of this is there was a child's crib, sort of a tragic story. A child's crib maker was a small company and they bought the license to, for the name of a large child products company and put it on the crib and it turns out the crib was very dangerous and uh, it had to be recalled and a lot of people got hurt and they wanted to sue the larger company who it had been branded under and their response was look we just licensed the name that was made by someone else we are not liable for the damages 
And I think that that's a really questionable thing because obviously the reason they were licensing that name in the first place is because it gave the customer the impression that it was that, that larger company stood behind it. The company with the brand name stood behind the product. And the last one I want to talk about here quickly is uh, the difference between the employee's interests and the employer. So for example, if you are a, uh, a salesperson and you're <clears throat> dealing with the purchasing agent at the company, um, sometimes the purchasing agent doesn't do a very good job of representing the employer's interests. Oftentimes they might be a sort of a bitter, jaded person who is ambivalent about you taking advantage of the employer. And the question is, is that acceptable for you to do? And I've described that as a passive um, example, but what if what if, uh, if they're not necessarily uh, at odds with their employer, but you cultivate that distinction by trying to make them your friend and telling them, you know, you're really gonna take that from them. You, you know, they're making a lot of money off this. You should uh, uh, come to my side, help me out a little bit more. Maybe I'll make it worth your while. Um, so that's, uh, those are some of the questions about what constitutes honest behavior. I wanted to give some of those ambiguous uh, issues to, to get our juices flowing. And now I want to talk about some of the ways in which we tend to rationalize some of our, some of our uh, questionable behavior. Um, one of them is, I, I went down sort of the line that I had over here, the Microsoft example of lying to your customer. Um, the reason the audience was so interested in that is because it was a funny, clever story. And we tend to diminish the dishonesty of what we're doing if it makes us feel clever. Um, in the English patient example I gave, that is an example of a, sort of an emotional story. It sort of tugs at the heartstrings. And so if someone can write an emotionally manipulative narrative, it makes, us, it, makes it easier for us to gloss over uh, the moral questions. And in terms of the Milgram's experiment, there was a reward. In this case, it was the approval of an authority figure. It might also be financial. It's probably the most obvious one in business. Um, I also find that status is a remarkably, uh, uh, is, is something that can highly motivate people and oftentimes get them to overlook the integrity of things. So if you have a sales group and you, you're always aggressively saying, here's the leader, here's the leader on the board, the top name, um, it's amazing what you can get people to do to be that top name because we all want the respect of our peers. Um, and in the uh, Stanford experiment, I think that that was cultivated through an us versus them mentality where the, the prisoners and the guards would uh, sort of become competitive over who was in charge. And because they saw that like their team was being disadvantaged by the other team, it was okay for them to do something for, to the other team, to harm the other team or disrupt the other team. So oftentimes there's an us versus them. You'll oftentimes find this, uh, uh, if you ever talk to a salesperson who's sort of resentful of their, uh, speaks with spite about their customers, yeah, they're always trying to get about, you can, you can be sure that that's a person who'd be willing to do something shady to get a better deal. Um, com competition, as I sort of alluded to earlier with status, if you cultivate competition among people, it's amazing what you can get us to do to, to be the victor. And also, uh, one of, these are, next couple are a couple of my favorite examples. One of them is what I call the trivial and the substantial. Oftentimes we end up telling ourselves if it's a small uh, for infraction of integrity, if it's a small amount of money, we're willing to, uh, we're willing to violate our integrity because, you know, it's not that big a deal. They probably wouldn't even care. But if it's a substantial amount of money that we have to gain from violating our integrity, then we do it and we just say, well, it's an exception. I'm only doing it. I'm only doing it because there's so much money involved. And so what you end up with is a situation where whether it's small or large, basically all scenarios, you're willing to compromise your integrity. Um, another one of my favorites is what I call the confirmation bias. This is where you, you, you lack self-awareness because if there's something that is the right thing to do and rewards your self-interest, obviously you do it. If there's something that's the wrong thing to do and it works against your self-interest, obviously you wouldn't do it. But the real question is what is there's something that will work towards your self-interest and uh, but is questionable or the wrong thing to do? Oftentimes we'll do it, and, but we, will still, we are still able to consider ourselves a good person, a person of integrity, because we are saying that when we do it for our self-interest, that reflects who we are. And when we do it uh, uh, for our self-interest, something that's wrong, um, that is an exception to who we are. And so we're, the reality is we're just doing whatever serves our self-interest, whether it's right or wrong, but because we diminish the things that are wrong, uh, we, we, we sort of identify ourselves as 
uh, doing it for the right reasons. And as a result, we're, we're sort of interpreting those scenarios to confirm our opinions about ourselves as honest people. Um, another uh, great example is the classic food for your family. Hey, I have to do this, it's food for my family, puts food on the table, to which I would always respond, well, perhaps you should find a, uh, a way to put food on the table for your family that the customers value or society that contributes to society. And we'll get a little bit into frameworks on that in a minute. Also, unfortunately, sometimes if you're trying to do the right thing, uh, a competitor doing, if there's a short-term gain that can be made profitably uh, at, at the uh, expense of integrity, they will violate it. And then all of a sudden to, com to keep up, you feel you have to do the same. You have to compromise your principles as well. And that creates the race to the bottom. Now let's uh, conclude with some discussions of some of the frameworks. One, uh, these are sort of ways of, of uh, thinking about integrity and defining what's, what constitutes integrity or doesn't. One of them is the just world hypothesis. And this is what I alluded to earlier when I spoke about uh, some of the trite examples of, you know, the good always wins and it's in the, in the long term, it's always the best, the honesty is always the best policy, always the best to do the right thing. Now, I don't want to disagree with that, and I certainly don't want to dissuade you of that view, because I don't really know that going around telling people that's not true is uh, uh, making the world a better place. But I do think that it's worth questioning whether, you know, even if it's not incorrect, is it incomplete? Um, I would argue that there's some weighting factors in there. And, and um, you know, sometimes there is, um, how should I explain this? Uh, to say that the long-term integrity and honesty are always the best policy implies that uh, there will be the, there will all, the negative consequences of doing, uh, taking a short-term gain will exceed the profit that you make. Now that's not untrue necessarily, but it it's an assumption. It assumes that there, you know, if the money is high enough and if the likelihood of getting caught or the likelihood of having another deal fall through because of this or hurting your reputation is low, that that isn't necessarily true. And I use the Wall Street financial crisis example here. There were a lot of people who were making so much money selling questionable products that you know, they weren't so concerned about their reputation because even if it all collapsed in another day, they had made million dollar bonuses, they could literally retire. And so short term, uh, they're, they're, and I get into my live presentation, uh, some, variabil some variables that might affect that. But uh, if you're doing, if they're short term transactions versus long term relationships, make it less likely that doing uh, the right thing will always be rewarded. Also, I talk about the everyone knows philosophy. This is essentially like a poker analogy. It's like saying, um, uh, uh, you know, in poker, we accept that bluffing and deception are a part of the game. So even if we're playing with our friends, we are willing to engage in deceptive activity. And this is the sort of uh, uh, application of that philosophy to business. Like, look, everybody knows we're in this for our own money. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take advantage of you if you let me. And, and everybody knows. Now, I've always um, been very skeptical of this as a philosophy because I say, look, if everybody knows, then everybody would be willing to admit it. Are you willing to admit to your client or your business partner that you intend to deceive them? I mean, if I'm playing poker with my friends, and they say, hey, are you going to bluff me? I'll say, it's fair game. I, I'm not going to tell you when I'm bluffing, but I'll certainly acknowledge that I, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm available to do. Whereas in business, what do we do? We don't say that. We don't say, hey, look, I know we're going to sit down and have a negotiation. You know I'm going to cheat you if I can. No, we say, hey, you can trust me. And so I don't think, even, I don't think people really believe it. I think they're just using that to rationalize. They're hiding behind that philosophy. A good example of that, there's a dealership, uh, car dealership that used to be here in Las Vegas called Integrity Chrysler. There is no dealership with less integrity than Integrity Chrysler. But it says right there in the name, Integrity. So I would, I would consider it dishonest, uh, intellectually dishonest, if the uh, staff there <clears throat> justified uh, their duplicitous behavior because they assumed that everybody knows or should know. Um, also profitable, uh, if something is profitable, Maybe it's fair game if it makes money for you. This is sort of Milton Friedman, the famous uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, 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 economist, free market economist, who says there's no such thing as corporate social responsibility. Um, I'm not a big proponent of that philosophy. I think there's a lot of, uh, we'll get into some of the ones that I do subscribe to in a little contrast with that. Another example is legal. You know, hey, if it's legal, it's fair game. It's, it's uh, you know, if, if, if lying or deceiving isn't illegal, then it should be fine. To which I've already always said, 
Um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, is everything that makes the, is everything that makes the world uh, a worse place illegal? And I would say not necessarily. And secondly, um, what if you are lobbying to write the laws? A good example of this right now, we have the, the candidacy of Mitt Romney, who was once, at, uh, for those of you who don't know, private equity people get a tax treatment called carried interest, which means they can actually end up paying lower taxes than a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people in similar industries or in similar tax brackets. And they once asked Mitt Romney uh, why he was willing to accept that low tax treatment, uh, the sort of loophole, if you will. And he said, hey, look, I don't, you expect me to pay more taxes than I'm supposed to? I mean, who would do that? Of course, I'm going to take advantage of it if it's legal. But, the art, but what he didn't tell you is that his firm, Bain Capital, was actually lobbying Congress to, to create that loophole and perpetuate that loophole. Every time somebody wanted to close it, they'd send a bunch of lobbyists. So that wasn't just accepting the law. That was actually writing the law and rigging the game for themselves. Um, let's talk about, so I'm going to draw a line here because those are some of the ones that I'm skeptical of. Here are some of the ones that I think are, are, are a little bit more high-minded. One of them is what's called the sunshine test. And it's called that because there's an old expression, sunshine is the best disinfectant, which means don't do anything that you would be uncomfortable seeing on the front page of the paper. If you are uh, you know, overcharging people or charging people's premiums, would you be embarrassed if that came to light? Uh, another a test that I really like is the reciprocity test. This is kind of like the, uh, the golden rule, if you will. And this sort of says, uh, would you do it to someone if, the, if would it be, uh, would you be all right if someone did the same thing to you? And I get back here to the sort of manipulation versus persuasion. One man's, one person's perception of this as a really clever tactic might be, uh, make them feel really manipulated if they were on the receiving end. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the sort of close person or family member or spouse. Would you be embarrassed to tell your grandchildren that you were f deliberately flouting EPA regulations and putting toxins into the drinking water or uh, you were lobbying to have those restrictions eliminated? So that's kind of the close person test. Um, another example is the universality test, which sort of says would you, uh, you know, if everybody did this, would it make the world a better place or a worse place? And when we get into some of the sales uh, manipulations, I'm particularly sensitive to that because um, I think that uh, oftentimes there are a lot of uh, tactics that, that sort of take advantage of people's feelings of obligation and fairness. So for example, if there's theatrics uh, involved in trying to create, you know, someone says to you, uh, uh, or, or, you know, what size shoe do you wear is an attempt to take more of their time. But is it really making the world a better place to try and trick people into listening to you and taking their time and putting, you're sort of taking advantage of the fact that they feel an obligation to answer a question from a stranger. And if you do that, you are creating a disincentive for people to want to talk to strangers. And I would argue that that makes the world a worse place. And then the last one, which is a good place to end, is the obituary. Would you be comfortable if your behavior was printed uh, right in your obituary? This person was known to have a business practice of this. So anyway, that is my sample presentation on integrity. Uh, it's a, actually a pretty thorough grouping of there. I could give something obviously about this much time, um, but if you get, with more time allowed, I, I put in a few more uh, facts and, and, and uh, uh, examples. But um, if you're interested in hearing something like this, I'd be, love to deliver it to you. Please visit me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Holy shit.